Member and uh, welcome. Uh, we just made a big announcement about the NFL Players Association. Things ran late. We apologize for that. We'll try to make up for it. I have the pleasure of introducing today um, two of our moderators who have put this together. Keith Reinhardt is Chairman Emeritus of DDB Worldwide, one of the largest advertising firms in the world, and is President of Business for Diplomatic Action. Business for Diplomatic Action, founded by Keith, is a nonprofit organization that addresses the decline of the United States standing in the world and engages the business community in citizen diplomacy. BDA serves as a range of multinational members, among them McDonald's, ExxonMobil, and Microsoft Corporation. His co-chair on this is Peter Chikansky. Peter is president and CEO uh, of the Business Council for International Understanding. Uh, Peter has served as president of the New York Business Council for International Understanding since 1996. He is chairman of BCIU Europe Limited, a London-based European subsidiary, and established BCIU's Washington office in 1998. BCIU's objective is to facilitate dialogue and action between business and government to promote international understanding while advocating for the full protection of intellectual property, contract sanctity, and donor intent. BCIU serves an influential corporate and individual membership base of leading companies and entrepreneurs in many industries and companies. Without further ado, our moderators, and Peter and Keith. Thank you. You said more about Peter than you did about me. <laughs> so, yeah, you're a good guy. I'm, I'm Keith Reinhardt, and uh, this is Peter Chachansky, my co-chair. We're both co-chairs. So that means you're my co-chair, -co so we're co-co-chairs. And uh, anyway, thank you very much for coming. It's uh, great to see you. We have some excellent presentations for you. And I know uh, my co-chair or co-co-chair would like to say a word of welcome. Thank you so much, Keith. Presenters was very rigorous. Uh, there was a remarkable range of very high quality uh, submissions. And what we saw was that the driver for a lot of these, uh, uh, these new ideas, really, was passion and leadership. Um, and not that far behind was uh, resources and infrastructure. And I think what we heard also was that all of these programs could scale up. But on the cutting edge of this uh, is the work that IBM is doing. And so uh, maybe I'll turn it back to you. As ha having spent my uh, business career serving a lot of client corporations, many of them multinationals, uh, it's always seemed very clear to me that uh, business and commerce provides natural bridges uh, and cross-cultural bridges for understanding and respect. In fact, the big multinationals that you heard in the previous uh, plenary session combine speed, scale, and efficiency in a way that uh, is often not possible through government agencies. Uh, in fact, the big multinationals are not only multinational, they are intrinsically multicultural. And in the course of doing their jobs and their international travel, hundreds of thousands of American business executives are already citizen diplomats, and maybe that leads them. Yes, thank you. We wanted to invite Stanley Litow to uh, kick off this session, and he's been uh, leading the efforts of uh, the corporation, which he'll explain to you now. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you, everyone. Nice, intimate uh, crowd here. Uh, they've given me 15 minutes, and I thought I would uh, uh, do a couple of things. Uh, uh, if you were in the other room, you heard a little bit about size and scale of IBM, big company, about $100 million, 125,000 people, operating in 170 different countries, uh, and uh, about 100 years old. Uh, my personal uh, background, although I wear the IBM badge and have run the IBM Foundation and Corporate Affairs and Citizenship of the company, I was in the not-for-profit sector for a long time, ran a think tank in New York City, did a lot of community organizing worked for the mayor, worked for the governor, was deputy chancellor of schools in New York City. So I've touched all sectors of the economy, and I understand that if you want to solve critical problems, no one sector of the economy 
not business, not government, not not-for-profit organizations can do it alone, and we're effective to the extent to which we work together. So thank you very much for the introduction. I'm going to tell you a little bit about IBM's approach here, and I didn't have uh, all that much time in the, in the other room to lay it out, but the focus of our activity really is to uh, look at what are the resources that the company has to offer, tie it into communities around the world, and figure out a way to achieve a triple benefit. Benefit into the community, benefit to the company, and benefit for the employees who are involved in this activity. So first and foremost, our approach is about, we're an innovation company, it's about what opportunities do we have to invent or create things that have a benefit to society. As a business, we invent things that help other businesses. We use our best technology and talent, supercomputing, a lot of innovative software, a lot of services to help build effective businesses. We do the same thing. I'll give you three examples in the community. Number one, grid technology. And that's all of the power on your individual PC. When you're not using it, you can donate that power. And we have created a program called World Community Grid, where about 1.7 million individual PCs can donate their power collectively, and then we can contribute that power to essentially give a supercomputer to researchers around the world who are working on some of the most difficult and challenging public policy questions and humanitarian research facing the world. Number one, they are uh, fueling cancer research, neuroblastoma, childhood cancer, AIDS research. They're working on rice DNA research. Uh, with a partnership with Tsinghua University, working on new ways uh, to clean the great river systems of the world. This is a way to create something, supercomputing power. By the way, it, when, in another year, it will probably be the most, super, most powerful supercomputer on the planet, and it will be able to do 25 large-scale, multi-million dollar research projects a year. And that's an example of using your innovation and creativity. <coughs> Another is automatic language tra translation technology to bridge a cultural divide. Ways to provide easy to use automatic language translation English to Arabic to solve the educational uh, differences between English and Ara Arabic speaking uh, communities. And second of all, to use voice recognition technology to help non-literate children and adults to read over the web for free. Last year it taught 112,000 non-literate children and adults to read. And finally, cloud computing. We developed an initiative where we intervene wherever there's a disaster in the world with an open source technology solution we call disaster relief in a box. But by putting it on cloud, the, the computing cloud, we bring down the cost, make it easier to deliver, so that wherever there is a disaster in the world, we can intervene quickly and easily with the kind of solutions that non-governmental organizations and government need to intervene. But I want to spend most of my time talking to you about the IBM Corporate Service Corps. And this is sometimes referred to as the corporate version of the Peace Corps. We developed it and launched it two years ago. It is, for an IBM employee, the hardest thing to get into. We select 500 of our top talent a year. You have to be number one performer. You have to have the best recommendation from your supervisors or managers. It's both for high-level employees and it's also for executives. We assign them in teams in the developing world. As you see, in two years, about 1,000 participants from 50 different countries, organized into 90 different teams. By January, there will be 100 different teams working in now 20 different countries. These are a couple of pictures that show them in their free time, but what they really do is develop a critical solution. As you heard from Deirdre uh, White up at the panel, in Cross River Province in Nigeria, working on the ground, they developed a social networking program around healthcare and social services in Cross River Province in Nigeria. The government had no such a program, they couldn't figure out how to set it up, they needed the hardware, they needed the software, they needed the skills and technology to be able to do it on the ground. We had one team that developed it, then they came back, we sent another team in, and now the government is well on its way to leading 
in Nigeria in terms of the social welfare space. In other places, they've created uh, small business entrepreneur programs in places like Kenya or in Tanzania. They developed a marketing and sales program for the tourist industry all over the world. We're sending teams into Cambodia, Vietnam, uh, Egypt, um, uh, Romania. Uh, we had uh, uh, teams of executives that have worked in Ho Chi Minh City, uh, Katowice in Poland, uh, Rio in Brazil, and now a team just came back from Chengdu trying to help municipal leaders, mayors of these cities, to try to figure out how to make their city a smarter city. And they're analyzing and developing a roadmap on how the city can improve its investments, its technology investments, and its strategy. This is a creative way for the company to build the next generation of leaders. The thousand people who've been involved in this program over the last two years, or the tens of thousands of them that will, they will be involved that will be involved in this kind of program in the future, will lead the IBM company. Because we cannot succeed as a company unless we have people who understand the kind of skills that they need to be able to focus their efforts in a global economy. You can't do that through business trips. When they go into a geography, a team of people lives together, they work 24-7, they come back to the company, they mentor the next team that goes in, they bank the projects and best practices on a variety of different websites, they create net networks for themselves, and the evaluation results of this program are absolutely off the charts. It helps us to attract top talent, it helps us to retain top talent, each team delivers about a quarter of a million dollars worth of pro bono, high quality technology services around the world. Governments are demanding teams of these people to be able to come into their geographies. A team is always uh, a team consisting of IBM employees from US, Western Europe, Latin America, Asia, so they're not a group of US people going over uh, to, their, to solve a problem. It's an integrated global team. A team is constructed with all the various skills that people on the ground would need. For example, the team that went to Ho Chi Minh City was led by the person who runs the IBM Research Lab in India, probably the most brilliant technologist in the company. Software developers, business consultants, uh, communication specialists, lawyers, finance, people so that you have on the ground all the skill and all the talent that you need to solve a problem. And this is not philanthropy. This is not about making a donation. This is about achieving a significant benefit to the company by building skill and talent within the company to be able to work collectively, solve problems. It helps people on their career track. It also provides significant benefit in these growth markets by giving them access to the absolute best problem solvers, the best skills, and the best talent that people have. That's what the Corporate Service Corps is about. From our standpoint, it is a critical, critical program in terms of figuring out our business strategy. People are developing solutions on the ground, they're developing growth markets, they're adding revenue to the company, they're building critical skills, they're developing new client relationships with small businesses and communities, you know, in the places that we really need to know and understand. In these geographies, it's not as simplistic as it is in operating in North America or mature markets. It's a, they are places where government, non-governmental organizations and businesses are working much more closely together. You need to understand the language, the culture, different kinds of teaming skills, and this creates a top-tier talent within the company. In terms of the future, we've now worked with a number of other companies that are starting programs modeled after the IBM Corporate Service Corps, uh, three or four of them already beginning with teams on the ground. We think that this is a future for commercial uh, uh, firms, large scale, small scale. We think that this model, a lot of the cur curriculum materials, the training materials that we've developed we're more than happy to share with other businesses so that they can bring this program into being in a relatively short period of time. We think it has scale-up potential. We spent a lot of time doing the return on investment analysis from an IBM standpoint. I could easily see going from 
a small number of companies to 10 to 20 to 30 to 40 to 50 Fortune 500 companies as the way in which they develop their focus around global development in the 1960s and 70s was through the idea of international assignment. That's what companies did. They took their best talent and they sent them to work in an overseas assignment for one to three years. The average cost of an overseas assignment like that for an executive at a company is $1.3 million a year. That's salary, that's tax uplift, that's living, moving and living. So from a company, if you wanted to have a significant number of people learning and developing in this way, you are making a huge, huge financial investment. If companies turn that program on its head, you could have hundreds of thousands of the best, most talented corporate executives working in these problems, uh, skill areas around the world, and you would really make a difference in the developing world. You would bridge the cultural divide. You would help people to understand problem solving. You would address the questions of uh, economic uh, solvency and, and, and peace and all the kinds of things that you want through a citizen diplomacy program. And you would do it in a way that was totally sustainable because it wouldn't be about check writing. It would be about building effective businesses. So that's what IBM's story about the Corporate Service Corps is all about. We refer to it sometimes as the corporate version of the Peace Corps, but it's so far beyond that. This is sending integrated and talented problem-solving teams uh, around the world. So it has an enormous amount of support from our CEO, from our board, from all senior leaders in the company. We're picking our next group of 500 people right now. As of last night, we had 22,000 applicants for those 500 slots. So we're going to be able to select people who are absolutely the best of the best. So that's what this program is all about. I appreciate the opportunity for uh, to give me to share it with you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions later on. Thank you. Good. We'll have some time for questions. Thank you very much, Stan. That was inspiring. I think we could give him a But let's move on. An organization I have long admired, and one I consider a model of applying entrepreneurial thinking uh, to specific needs of a strategically important region of the world, is the Education for Employment Foundation, or EFE. If international business machines can be IBM, then Education for Employment can be EFE. Uh, Jamie McAuliffe is president of EFE which creates economic opportunities in the private sector for youth in the Middle East and North Africa. And they aim to mobilize American students, corporate staff, and NGO partners to provide youth with access to education, mentoring services that improve private sector employment. So, Jamie, welcome. Since I'm sitting there, so I'm going to be his first client for this next team of IBM corporate volunteers. That sounds amazing, that, that program. Um, I uh, am really, really pleased to be here. I like to sort of think of myself as a global citizen, I'm like many of you, I'm sure. I grew up around the world. Um, I've lived and worked around the world. Early in my career, I did Teach for America, which was also often described as the domestic Peace Corps. Um, I worked for a number of years with an organization called Ashoka whose whole mission is to support and seed innovation and social entrepreneurship in developing countries. And I'm a big believer in not only fostering opportunities for young people to get experience and, and uh, Americans to get uh, volunteer experiences abroad, but also, as one of the speakers last night said, get talent from the other parts of the world to come to the United States and share their experiences, which is something that Ashoka is premised on, and we hope with the FE at some point we'll be able to provide opportunities for our alumni to, uh, to come to the United States and, uh, and exchange with young people here as well as bring young people over there. I'm going to get to some of our ideas that got us to this event today for engaging corporate citizens, but um, first I want to just ask a, a question to the audience. I was at a, uh, another event yesterday with the head of Gallup 
What do you think the number one concern as Gallup polls people around the world is today? Anybody have a guess? Jobs. It's jobs, exactly. Everybody is concerned about getting and keeping a good job. And there's nowhere in the world um, uh, that's, that's looking at this and, and facing more serious problems in the Middle East and North Africa. The, unfortunately, the, the rates of youth unemployment in particular reach upwards of 40%. Um, there's a growing demographic youth bulge that um, exacerbates this problem. Over the next 15 years, 100 million new jobs will have to be created just to stay even. Um, so it's a huge, huge challenge. Um, and it's why EFE was created, to essentially begin to address this challenge. And as Stan and others have, have talked about, one of the things we believe very uh, strongly in is the power of partnerships. We have built a model that directly links our services to the needs of the business sector and the marketplace. And um, those of you who know youth employment programs uh, know that there are many training programs that identify skills young people need, train them, and then help them look for a job. What EFE does is actually start on the other side. We go to talk to business leaders in the countries where we operate, and we ask them, what are the skills that you need? What's really striking in a place like the Middle East where there are so many new jobs that have to be created is that there are jobs going unfilled because businesses are telling us and others they can't find young people with the skills they need to be successful in their businesses. So EFE has created an approach to identify the skills that businesses need, um, develop customized training to meet those needs, and recruit low-income young people who have been jobless for at least six months and put them through this training program and into a job. The other innovation is we ask in return from the businesses to pre-commit to hiring the young people so that we're not training with the hope of a job, but training directly linked to a job. There are too many training programs out there that create a lot of expectation, a lot of frustration, unfortunately, for young people because they get all this, these new skills, they, they, they get all this optimism and hope, and at the end of the day, there's no job. So we, we tried to develop something that was, was quite different. And it depended heavily on, on companies and corporate partners. So we have developed over 400 partnerships with small, medium, and large companies. We're beginning to build broader multinational uh, corporate partnerships with companies like Manpower, the largest private employer in the world, and Microsoft. Um, and that is really going to help us fuel the next uh, stage of our growth. We're a, a small, uh, growing nonprofit. We've been in place for five years. We work in five countries across the Middle East and North Africa, Yemen, West Bank, uh, Gaza, Jordan, Egypt, and Morocco. But we have ambitions to be across the region, and that's only going to happen if we can continue to partner with businesses, uh, other nonprofits, and governments to help us get to, to greater scale. So with that backdrop, I'll just describe a few of the, the initiatives that we're launching today and hoping to engage partners, both corporate partners as well as other nonprofit partners. We are um, big believers in two themes related to youth development. One is, is the power of peer exchanges and peer learning. Many of you, our young people, and this, is, this was astonishing to me when I joined EFE, go through the training program, get the job, and are so, uh, so committed to EFE that they voluntarily pay a certain percentage of their first year salary back to support the next class of young people. They self-organize to take trips to low-income communities to do cleanups, to um, do, service, uh, do, do service projects. And we are trying to create a more systematic way to support those alumni so that they can give back to their communities, bring young people from the United States and other countries to, uh, to, to the region to teach English, to provide peer support. We have marketing technology, other projects that are well-suited for young undergraduates and even graduate students who can come spend a summer or six months. Um, so that's one piece. We're trying to, to really build a whole peer approach that would start with peer-to-peer in-person, student-to-student exchanges, and then be continued through e-mentoring initiatives. E -mentoring initiatives. We're part of the uh, PNB, the Partnership for New Beginning, and we're trying to ensure that our alumni get access to the e-mentoring platform as part of that. So that's one thing. 
the, the other um, related to, to peers is teaching. So we are hoping to partner with organizations that are trying to send well-qualified teachers to the Middle East and North Africa who could pair up with our trainers and help us teach our, our training. And as we build new curricula, new training, um, we'll need more people on the ground who can pair up with our existing trainers to deliver um, more training in more subject areas. So that's a second uh, piece of our uh, service learning. Then the company piece is really in two, uh, in two programs. One is similar to the IBM program, we are looking to really engage more um, deeply and broadly corporate volunteers who could come in and really help work with our existing organizations. We have five independent affiliated foundations who in their own right are growing and expanding and need help in every area you can imagine in, in terms of organizational capacity. So building their staffs, their websites, their marketing and branding their uh, development. And we are looking for companies who can send um, well-skilled volunteers to work with our, our nonprofits and our social entrepreneurs who lead them to help them grow so that they can serve more young people. And finally, we are also looking to, um, to leverage corporate volunteers who can be mentors. Uh, this is a big concept in the United States. It's been proven through research how important an adult mentor is in the lives of a young person when they transition to adulthood. It's not a, it's not a very rel um, uh, accepted concept yet in the Middle East and North Africa, but we're hearing from our alumni that they would love to be connected to mentors in the business sector who can help them think about their careers as they start their job, how they can continue to build their skills and careers, how they can, for some of them, look to launch new businesses and become entrepreneurs in their own right. So we're launching a mentorship program that will pair um, corporate volunteers with our young people to help them as they develop um, develop their careers and lives. I think with that, I'll, I'll end, and I know we're going to take questions in a few minutes. Thank you for having me. Thank you, James. Before we move on to the uh, next part of the program, maybe uh, Peter and I each get a question to our previous presenters. <clears throat> Stan, I was interested in a couple of things. One, how, how you pick the countries or the projects uh, for uh, for your focus, and also uh, the partnerships in, in those projects with NGOs or with other corporations. Uh, are, what are you looking for? What are you looking for from the people in this room? For example? Well, we're, we're right now we're working with three uh, NGO partners: uh, Here for White's organization, uh, CBC, CBS. Uh, in a variety of different uh, uh, countries. We're working with Digital Opportunities Trust, and we're working with Australia Business Volunteers. These are uh, NGOs that have a presence in a variety of the countries that we're interested in. We partner with them in the development of a particular projects. Uh, many of those partner NGOs didn't have the exact same experience that we were looking for, so we had uh, to work together on figuring out could they accommodate their traditions and their programs to meet our needs? We're interested in very large interdepartmental teams and interdisciplinary teams, and some of them had experience with single program, individual, or two or three people. Uh, the next thing is that you know we had to work with them on the the duration of these projects. So some of them you know have been involved with much smaller numbers of people over longer periods of time. To make it sustainable within a company, all the participants work for two and a half months before they go on their assignment, building their team, analyzing their project, setting up the project management plan, and understanding how they get to the geography and hit the ground running. And they spend one month, 24-7, working on the ground, and then two and a half months when they come back mentoring the next team that goes in, so there's constant continuity. So the partners that we need are able to work with that kind of a project. In terms of developing the plans for individual geographies, we're interested in the places where our NGO partners have significant skill and experience on the ground, places where IBM might be interested in, in terms of geographies from the standpoint of business opportunity. I'll give you an example. When we sent our team into Nigeria, the example of the Cross River province, at that point, we had 18 employees in all of Nigeria. 
now we have an idea in office. We're planning to operate and send up, set up a call center there. We've got a big couple of billion dollar business deal with VART to do the telecommunications infrastructure across 16 different African countries. So sometimes sending the team in is helpful in beginning the process of development. So it turns on its head the idea that companies used to think is wait until you have large numbers of people and clients on the ground and then start engaging the community. The, this starts with the community engagement and then it leads to further business investment. So we're looking for partners who have good relationships in a variety of different communities that we would be interested in, are willing to adapt what they do and work with us in adapting the model to make sure that these projects are successful. And in any collaboration, in any partnership, you're looking for somebody who is willing to be flexible and innovative to solve a problem. Very good, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. Stan, it just occurs to me that uh, another benefit to, to the world, really, global citizenship, is how working with companies like Barty, which is a terrific company, but you know, not all the companies in India at that scale are very active in this, so the contagion of, or the, the learning that you're providing, you know, is not only are they, you know, strictly speaking, for partners to implement, but you're changing the corporate culture of a, of a big company in India, which, which is very important, I think. Um, Jamie, the, um, my question is really op sort of operational. Uh, I don't think I heard you say that uh, the U.S. government was particularly involved. Um, I might have missed that, but um, the, the, we, the reason I ask that is that it's, this has clearly been a region uh, for at least a decade where uh, the United States has been, the government has been concerned about um, uh, unemployment, youth, youth issues, and uh, so I wanted to ask you that, and then briefly uh, two other questions which I'll add to what, uh, you know, in addition to what I just asked. Well, I'll get in trouble if, if anybody from the State Department is here because they are a huge supporter of ours. In fact, they've helped seed our programs in every country except, and in fact, they'll probably uh, be supporting us in the West Bank and Gaza as well. Um, since this was a corporate partnership, uh, they might emphasize that, but they've been hugely helpful. And we're, you know, we're looking in terms of our funding mix for funds from government, private foundations, wealthy individuals. You know, I, I didn't mention this, and I should have, but our founder, Ron Ruder seeded this with his own money. He's a businessman in New York. He's a real estate entrepreneur who really believed in um, addressing this problem and gave his own money to help seed it. Uh, and it really is to seed it because we believe our long-term model is to work with companies who will, over time, um, and they are already beginning to do this, recognize the value of the services that we're providing to them in terms of a skilled, retainable young employee <coughs> and cover a certain percentage of the cost of delivering that. But, Right now, it's, it's a mix of government, private funding, along with corporate contributions that is allowing us to provide the training and the, and the job placement and the support. But further, since you're working in very difficult countries, you, have, you know, Yemen, which is the closest thing to a Al-Qaeda state, I think, in the world today, um, do, you, do you get resistance? I'm thinking about locally from the yeah. leadership. I'm thinking about how uh, George Soros's involvement was very threatening to some political leaders uh, <coughs> in the early 90s when he opened uh, Open Society and Secret Offices throughout Central Eastern Europe. You know, in some countries, um, we don't right now partner very uh, explicitly with the governments. And in fact, it, it goes to our model. We start by talking to the most progressive business leaders in the country. So in Yemen, for example, we started by recruiting onto our board some of the uh, leading business figures. And they get it. I mean, they know that this is a huge problem. In Yemen, I think it's 7% of the population is under the age of 25, and the unemployment rates are 40, 50%. So it's, it's in their interest to figure out how to solve this problem. And so that's where we, we start, and we've essentially been able to operate a little bit under the radar screen. At some point, we'd love to be able to work with a viable Yemeni government to really take this to national scale. Um, I don't know if this is under your question, we do definitely have to be careful about the kind of branding of a U.S. Um, uh, you know, U.S. organization in the region, and that's why we don't we actually don't describe our, our approach as sort of an anti-terrorism approach. Um, we actually describe it more about providing hope and opportunity for young people, which is what it what it really is about. And we do believe that 
if we can do that, we are also addressing some of the root causes of instability in the region, and that's obviously an incredibly important element of what we're trying to do. And what others are trying to do is they uh, work with young people to get them on a, on a productive track in life. That's great. Great story. We're going to play musical chairs now and ask Stan and Jamie to uh, take the front row seats here and the four panelists to join us at the table. And then we are going to have time. If everybody hits their mark, we'll have time for questions for everybody. Um, <clears throat> so we'll move to the next part of our program. Um, uh, yeah, state your names. We have new names. <laughs> So, moving to the next part of our program, <coughs> let me introduce uh, Ruth Ann Renault, Vice President for Women's Philanthropy and Interactive Marketing, Opportunity International. It's uh, Opportunity International is a microfinance organization that provides small business loans, savings, insurance, training to people working their way out of poverty in the developing world. And uh, the Walk a Mile in Her Shoes program is unique. A lunch hour walk, she'll describe a fundraiser that enables employees to choose and walk for an actual opportunity. Ruth? Thank you. Well, good morning, and thank you all for being here. It has been really a very fascinating few days being here in D.C. and being able to spend time with partners in the work that we do in the nonprofit arena, and especially in the issue of poverty eradication in the developing world, and to find others that care so passionately about that cause, as well as other causes that really help us all become global citizens in so many ways. So, opportunity is a Christian microfinance organization that was actually founded by a retired Bristol Myers executive in 1971 with the goal of creating business solutions to poverty. And today, our unique bank-based microfinance model and innovative products and training serve over 2 million clients with loans, savings, and insurance in more than 20 <coughs> countries in the developing world. You'll see as you look at this slide with the various statistics there that we also are, are quite pleased to share that we have a 95% loan repayment rate. And in today's economic environment, that is something that is really quite outstanding considering that the clients that we are serving are reflective of some 3 billion people that live on less than $2 a day. And in deploying those services to the 2 million clients that we serve, we have some 11,500 staff members, predominantly indigenous to the countries in which we operate in, that are actually making those financial services available. And in speaking a little bit more specifically about those clients, 84% of our clients are women entrepreneurs. And for those of you that are familiar with the microfinance arena, you, know, you probably have some, some sense of the type of work that we do and the reason why women are at the heart of our, our client community. And, and the reason for this is as their businesses and incomes grow, so does their investment in the nutrition, the health, and the education of their children and communities. They are really the change agents within those communities that are going to help lift those communities up and to help them thrive. And this, this concept of helping to fund and to fuel the business of an independent entrepreneur someone that is most likely outside the formal economy, is something that our business partners have resonated with for many years. So business people all over the world have embraced the power of microfinance as a sustainable solution to global poverty. And development experts, of course, also know and recognize that microfinance is one of the best ways to unleash the economic power of women in the developing world. And with today's you know, topic <coughs> and our gathering being centered on corporate involvement, it, it's a wonderful place for us to be able to highlight the partnerships that we have in this arena 
You know, corporations and foundations that have a strong commitment to women's issues are increasingly partnering with Opportunity International to help us innovate and to expand and strengthen our ever-growing outreach to women living in poverty. So organizations such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, <coughs> the Nike Foundation, MasterCard, the Omidar Network, Goldman Sachs and Levi Strauss, and if I may be so bold as to say perhaps IBM, you know, are coming alongside our work and what we are doing today in so many places in so many ways, from technology innovations to the staff training that we do to the services that we are delivering in so many areas of the world. But in addition to that corporate support, which we've had for many years, we also get some of our support from private individuals and those that have come alongside our work. And we're looking to expand beyond that to be able to increase the awareness and support of opportunities, microfinance solutions within the professional community, and especially with young professionals. Those individuals that are coming into their careers and are committed to making change and don't recognize the borders and the boundaries that, that some of us have grown up knowing. And that brings us to our submission today within the business track for our philanthropic employee engagement program. It's really quite simple. It's a turnkey lunchtime walk for opportunity. It encourages young professionals to simply walk a mile in her shoes. And in doing so, our goal is to engage young professionals, become better global corporate citizens, as they learn about and ultimately advocate and raise funds among their peers to benefit Opportunity International clients and programs. We've heard a lot here today and yesterday about the desire to be able to be in the field, to be able to touch the work, to be part of the solution. Well, part of the power of this program is that you can be engaged with a critical global issue, and you can educate and inspire your colleagues without leaving the country, and you can make that global impact here today and potentially from your own desk. So our lunchtime walk, which is part of Opportunity's larger Change the World at Work campaign, has two audiences, corporate engagement officers, and we're beginning to put materials together for that. So for those individuals whose jobs are to be able to bring this program to their employees. And then the second audience is the globally-minded corporate citizens. We plan to speak directly to professionals with a heart of the <coughs> and a passion for creating global change. And for fun, we created a rough spot for you of what a potential ad could look like that could be promoted to young professionals via YouTube. <laughs> what if you could change the world on company time? What if you could fight global poverty? without taking a vacation day? What if you could help women in developing countries build small businesses and a better future for their children and communities right in your workplace? Women like Rosemary, who started a small school in her house, and today, with the help of loans from Opportunity International, she's educating 900 children every year. What if you could give entrepreneurs like Rosemary the opportunity they're waiting for over your lunch hour? Just go to opportunity.org, change the world at work. We'll show you how to lead the charge. We'll even help you take your boss on board. If you really want to change the world and not just daydream about it, this is your opportunity. that captured your attention, perhaps tugged a little bit at your heart, and to the point that you made at the beginning of the presentation, Keith, what we're looking to do is to find ways to enable employees to apply their passion and their leadership, to take leadership of this type of program. These types of programs, however, need resources, and they need infrastructure, and that's where that corporate engagement and that corporate CSR support comes in, and then it has the ability to scale. So whether it's from a single office, or multiple offices around the country or around the world, there's the ability to make this change simply while you're at work. We hope that you will be part of it. We look forward to questions and to look at being part of the conversation here today. Next is uh, Carol Luptis. 
Gerald is the director of the Tangier American Litigation Institute for Moroccan Studies. The institute is a place where Moroccans and Americans learn from each other through academic exchanges, community activism, and the arts. Well, thank you very much, uh, Peter and Keith, and uh, for all of you for this opportunity. Uh, now that Peter has pronounced uh, what uh, Talim stands for, I don't have to repeat the mouthful. It's much easier in Arabic because Talim means education in Arabic, which is what we're all about. Uh, we're actually part of the American Institute for Maghreb Studies, with the Research Center in Morocco, for uh, AIMS. But um, you can see that it started out as a diplomatic uh, building. Um, it's the only national landmark uh, abroad. And it's right in the center of the uh, Medina of Tangier. So after, uh, after a period of uh, uh, uncertainty in the 1970s, it was saved. And uh, this is a, a fantastic uh, example of uh, how American diplomacy worked really in the center of the populations uh, from back in uh, 1821. Uh, the Sultan of uh, Morocco at the time, Moulay Suleiman, gave the building to the United States. And so it's the oldest uh, continuously occupied uh, diplomatic property uh, that the State Department owns. So uh, for the last 40 years, now that it's no longer a, a diplomatic establishment, we've been involved in some of the things that uh, Ruth Ann uh, has just uh, mentioned. But one of our programs that's uh, the most successful and uh, long-lasting is the Women's Literacy Program. And uh, women who are our neighbors in the Medina uh, come to learn to uh, read and write. Actually, step number one is learning to how to hold a pencil. And uh, our oldest is a student uh, this year is 81 years old, so we can never stop uh, learning. But we also uh, teach uh, young people uh, here you have a group of uh, Moroccan students visiting at the museum, so we're at a museum as well. Uh, but we have American students coming through every summer to uh, learn Arabic, this intensive uh, State Department uh, language program, uh, critical language uh, scholarships. And so uh, we're very happy to uh, be involved with uh, cultural preservation as well. Uh, this year is the uh, centenary of the birth of uh, Paul Bowles, an American writer and composer who lived in Tangier for most of his adult life. And so in partnership with Moroccan institutions and uh, US funding, uh, we're having digitized the music that he recorded for the Library of Congress uh, in 1959, thereby saving uh, this example of uh, Morocco's cultural heritage and bringing it back uh, to Morocco in a digital form. So we have a, a beautiful location, it's, uh, it's charming, it's enchanting, the title of the book that was recently written about the location, but we also have uh, some serious challenges because we're located on the Strait of Gibraltar, and you might not be able to make out uh, Gibraltar behind all the mold, uh, because that's what happens when you're in one of the most humid places in Morocco. Uh, it's usually you have 89% uh, humidity, uh, that's when it's not raining quite often, so uh, it's, it's a challenge, but uh, we are getting help because the building is still owned by the U.S. government, so it's on the list, in fact, it's the oldest of the Secretary of State's uh, culturally significant properties, and so there is right now a uh, very intensive jackhammer uh, program that's still ringing in my ears, it just got to the States a couple of days ago, uh, but it starts at the top. And the idea is that uh, this will help uh, uh, protect our uh, collection from the uh, water, from the humidity. Uh, we had some uh, London-based uh, restorers come to spend a week at uh, the location in Tangier in September. Again, uh, the State Department will be able to send them. Uh, but that is somewhat symptomatic of what has happened over the years because it's, a, it's very much a shoestring operation. And so we've gotten help from very uh, well-meaning people, uh, but they've only stayed for a week or two uh, at a time. And so our goal is to establish a permanent um, conservatory or a way that we can uh, greet uh, experts 
who will uh, help us out over a sustained period, which brings us to our proposal for this uh, Citizen Diplomacy Summit. We thought that it would be possible uh, with a modicum of investment to set up the scholarship internship program, working with some American universities that are specialized in this. We have uh, right here in Washington, the George Washington University uh, Museum Management Program, but also University of Arizona has a, in their College of Engineering, a, a material science uh, conservation program. Uh, University of Utah uh, specialized in, in book preservation. So we felt that we could work with these universities to bring students on a, a semester rolling basis uh, to be in touch with their uh, Moroccan counterparts. We, we work with Moroccan institutions and to get credit uh, working at what is a, a unique uh, American museum abroad in uh, Medina. Uh, we work with uh, Moroccan institutions. Uh, here we have uh, a Moroccan architect, uh, Perry, showing us uh, examples of restoration programs that uh, her foundation for the uh, Medina of Tangier is, uh, is organizing. It's uh, the restoration of the fortress, which will become a, uh, a home for various cultural uh, institutions. And uh, we would like to, to use this expertise to, to reorient the museum, to give a better sense of its, its history. I mean, there are stories that are in the walls, but we want to put them on the walls and we need this uh, expertise. So this, uh, as Edward R. Murrow said, uh, international communication is uh, most important in the last three feet. And we're definitely on the ground. We're even on the rooftops of uh, Tangier. And so uh, we hope that uh, you'll come to visit us even before we have our uh, bicentennial in 2021. So uh, welcome to Tangier. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, Susan, you're here, right? Shin the hat. <laughs> no, I know how to say shin the hat. I just couldn't see you down there. She is founder and president of, of My World. It's a two-way internet portal to feature uh, engaging top tier stories about real people in the developing world. So uh, I'll let you tell us all about that. Sure. Back in the spring of 2006, I traveled to a remote region of Azad, Kashmir, in northern Pakistan with a group of 12 New York City paramedics who were making a return trip six months after the earthquake there that killed 73,000 people. I expected to see suffering, and I did. What I had absolutely no idea that I would experience was a number of people who were living in cardboard boxes and wanted to give us their last cup of cooked rice. Or how much fun one blonde, blue-eyed woman could have in a sweltering trash tent with 50 Urdu-speaking moms and their little kids, and no props but a couple of oranges and a pair of Ray-Bans. That was the revelation. After a couple of weeks, we saw 2,500 patients in the first five days people were in real trouble. And when I got back to the States, I did what I do. I was the top writer at People Magazine with a re weekly uh, readership of 43 million. And I got a six-page story on Zod Kashmir in People Magazine, which was no small feat. I was also surprised at how well-received it was. We were on CNN, and they just went through all that. Everybody loved it. And it was a real disappointment to me to really come face to face and confront the idea that it really wasn't going to happen again because mainstream media covers initiatives and causes and political threats and situations. But the one thing <coughs> that it doesn't cover almost ever is real compelling storytelling on real human beings in the remote parts of the so-called third world. So I quit Time Incorporated after 32 years, <laughs> two years ago and uh, created myworld.com. A lot of thought went into it. And um, I thought, how can we make this thing happen realistically? Well, let's use available technology. This is a little flip digicam on by Cisco. Cisco bought it for 590 million about three years ago. And the cool thing about these is that they don't require any inherent tech infrastructure. It's 
problems of censorship and stuff doesn't really apply to this. You can give this a kid to a kid who's backpacking through Nepal. All you have to do is click that little button and you can both power up and upload an hour's worth of broadcast quality content from these things. So I thought, well, what if we got these little cameras into the hands of 1.6 million NGOs working around the world? who know the lay of the land and the language and all that stuff. And what do they want more than anything in the world? They want to get their stories out. But they can't, because there's been such a decimation of media. And I thought, well, if we did that, and we did these fabulous stories, like P.T. Barnum, just get the folks into the tent, then we can put in links to anything. NGOs, initiatives, corporations, you name it. Anything except hatred, violence, and prejudice, because that's being covered elsewhere. We don't need that on my role. So then I learned that the dollar amount of small donor, median $50 hits, charitable contributions every year in the United States is in the neighborhood of $220 billion. A lot of that's strictly religious, a lot of it's domestic. So what? It's a revenue stream worth paying attention to. And I thought, well, what if you read a story about a little kid in the Double Joy AIDS orphanage in Banda, Western Kenya, and she's wearing a little party dress, and then she was wearing some beat-up gunboat shoes that didn't really fit her, and for the first time ever, you could one-click a wholesale pair of Target.com baby shoes. To this little girl, her village, the NGOs. What if you really created something like that? What if you could monetize the site that way by involving corporations who have long-term slogans like the human network, or just do it, or I'd like to teach the world to sing, and bring them into this global platform. And what you would give them for their advertising dollars is a global wholesale outlet for appropriate goods and services, global coverage of worthy CSR initiatives, everything that we've been discussing this morning. You can give them presence in emerging markets, and you can get their branding known all around the world in a very positive way. So this made sense to me. How do we actualize it? Well, this is what it looks like. You can go to the site one of two ways, and this is all malleable. This is, this is just what we did, you know, with a great design team. Um, you can pick a place in the world, I'm sorry this isn't live, but if you see it on the beta site, it's pretty cool. These are stills. It's on his journey. See the Coca-Cola logo? Her journey is brought to you by the Coca-Cola company. Stories have beginning, middles, and ending. That's what stories are. But in this case, we can link to eight other stories. We call these in the people parlance, the sidebars. <laughs> You've got your lead and your sidebars. This just covers every possible angle that you could want to know. Women's issues. The local guy, the teacher who has a cultural anthropology degree and speaks K'iche and he had to work for eight years as a window washer in D.C. He started this whole thing. This is a video screen wall that we have. These are related projects, volunteerism, anything you want to know. That's a CSR project by Coke for water development. And if you want to go in solely by issues, then you can go into a separate track. And this is health, women's issues, education, maybe solar, whatever. And the all-important social networking component lets you create your own My World. You can connect corporations, projects, NGOs, people, friends, whatever you want. That's how it works. What do we need to start it? We need four million bucks. Once. I don't need skyscrapers or airplanes or anything else. It's a website. But what I do need is absolutely top-tier talent. CFOs, uh, we need to have a corporate liaison people, NGO coordination. I need a college intern wrangler for all these kids who want to work for this thing already. And if we can get that initial seed funding from gifts, philanthropic sources, grants, what that's going to do is free up the money that we make from advertising revenues and after-tax profits to be turned into sustainable development in the third world, building schools and hospitals working with the kind of people who are here. It's just this revenue stream. It's sort of like Robin Hood, except we're not stealing from the rich. We're giving them a global advertising platform at a time when there's an absolute decimation of traditional advertising methods. Is the world ready for my world? 
You may have heard that a few months ago, there was another huge internet portal started, 64-page global internet magazine aimed at English-speaking audiences in the developed world. It's called Enlightenment. It's published by Al-Qaeda. And the lead story on the front page of the premier issue is how to build a bomb in your mother's kitchen. At the same time, I am receiving fan mail from all around the world, places like Sudan and Nepal and Guatemala. Here's one. Dear Susan, my heartiest wish for the success of MyWorld.com, and I shall eagerly wait that to be launched. Everybody wants to publish a nice story of a billionaire's success, but very few like you, Susan, thinks about the plight of those who uses their human energy and struggles every day for the peace of some bread. Thank you for your moral support to the struggle again, Susan. Regards, Vishnish, the rickshaw pullers of Delhi. Three billion people are trying to say hello to us, and I think my world is a really shiny, happy, great, fresh new way to say hello back. In closing, I'll share with you my favorite slogan for the last two years from the writer Sarah Ben Brennan. She says, the world needs dreamers and the world needs doers, but what the world really needs are dreamers who do. Thank you.
not only are they not going away, but they represent this, I think, an sort of underlying theme here, um, a huge opportunity for, uh, for our, uh, our world. So what I, I wanted to do was um, to tell you about a little bit about our program here. In particular, I wanted just to present very briefly a model that's been incorporated into my university. And it's in a few others too, but it's just beginning. And it's, it's a model of higher education where we're decentralizing. The universities, particularly large ones, are made up of central administration. You have your presidents and vice presidents. Then you have a whole series of schools. You have school of medicine, school of engineering, school of business, etc. I'm one of 15 in my university. I'm a school of business. Before, the new president, the individual by the name of Michael Rao, came to our campus about two years ago, we had a centralized system. Literally, the, and it was a good one. It built our university up. But we had very little flexibility to be entrepreneurial to, to, and to do things we can thought were important. That all changed. Um, and so we've been able to create programs that have, in our case, the business school, some long-term sustainability, particularly in the case I want to present in, uh, in South India. We've been partnering with, with uh, Christ University in Bangalore. Um, I'm leaving for India at the end of the month to talk to four other institutions. But here's what I think, um, I think is really valuable uh, that we've been allowed to do. We've been allowed to take on and be entrepreneurs in our school to enhance, expand, and prepare, and improve our students, and it was mentioned here that we need to bring more international students to, to our country and put our, our students and our young people abroad. Um, Virginia, VCU, Virginia Commonwealth University, is a state-run organization. We're not a private rich institution. Johnny and Sally, Virginia go there. Most of them work. 80% okay? of my students work. They're not going to have this study abroad uh, opportunity. That doesn't mean they can't meet Juan from Latin America or a, um, Ahmed from, from Morocco, or, uh, or uh, Sanjay from India. We can bring them here. And we all also can do it in a way that we're doing right now with Christ University in Bangalore, a private school, one of the best uh, universities, I think, uh, particularly in the business arena, um, in which we set up a model that allows, it's a, called the 2 plus 2 plus 2, two degrees, two years, and, and um, uh, in two different cultures. And what it amounts to is that we, um, have been able to go to and partner with this university, and we've been able to, to recruit uh, their students to, to study at this university for their MBA, and then take their second year with us for an MS degree. Um, they, in turn, because these students are represent the rising middle class of these big emerging markets, pay our out-of-state tuition. And the key to the success and sustainability of these programs and the growth of our business school and other schools that follow this model lies in the fact that the central administration, believing in decentralization, has said to us, you can keep 90% of that tuition. You the business school, not me. You the business school you can keep 97% of that tuition to build your own programs and develop your own uh, dreams. That was pointed out uh, by our last speaker. Um, that's, you know, I, it's, the story is more involved than that. I mean, we, are, we are creating a small UN. We are also taking our students abroad via the generation of this sustainable stream of our revenues. I want to leave you with a quote that I really found intriguing too. You maybe have heard it other places. I heard it for the first time um, in India. You cannot wake up a man who is pretending to be asleep. I think this applies to a lot of what's going on in, in certain places, in certain dimensions of our world. You know, people don't hear us because they're pretending to be asleep. People don't see what's going on. It is not about the U.S versus India or China, or China versus Europe, or India versus China. That's not the model, I don't think. The model is about great organizations that build great value chains and stretch around the world, connecting the best and brightest to create the highest quality products and services at the lowest possible price. That's the game. That's who wins. Um, we want to create the intellectual capital that goes into that, that game uh, to sustain not only our country, uh, and our region, and our community, but the world as well. So, uh, Tom, are you saying not much time? All right, well, Stan and Jamie stand up, and um, we have time for maybe two questions. Yes, sir, right there. Yes. Um, I have a question that puts a little bit different emphasis, perhaps. But I'm to see all the good work that's been done by large corporations that have food supply overseas. Uh, my question is, um, what are the possibilities for inspiring local businesses? You know, the huge majority of local businesses in the country are small, local, and 
producers that don't really have aggression on their season. These are also the producers who want to engage the citizens of the city. What is the motivation for those companies uh, to become involved and engage? Uh, uh, one uh, possible tool that could be used. IBM and the World Bank created something called the SME Toolkit. It's a free interactive site on the web, smetoolkit.org. It has about 5 million users. It's in 17 languages, and it's uh, used in 30 different countries. And it has a set of tools on it for small and medium-sized enterprise to build their business. And it includes like how to do a business plan, how to do a marketing strategy, how to trade internationally, but collaborative tools so individual small entrepreneurs can partner together. Very easy to use, and there are local partners in each uh, country, sometimes businesses, sometimes government, sometimes uh, NGOs who operate in those areas. And it would be relatively easy to add content on that site, which has a large number of users in local language about the kind of information that we're talking about here. And that's just one suggestion. Yeah, there's something about the literacy program in uh, Legation of Tangier. Um, that's not just literacy for literacy's sake. Uh, these women have uh, been inserted into the job market. They've had local employers and multinationals come to the Legation and hire women, you know, 10 this year, 15 following year, this kind of thing. Uh, and they've actually gotten work. Part of the, uh, the program is not just the literacy, but also learning other skills. Uh, one of the women uh, had a flair for art. Uh, she actually had a uh, showing, uh, sold some of her art. She was able to install electricity and running water in her home. So uh, people see the benefit of this kind of uh, engagement pretty directly. I think uh, mobilizing small and medium-sized businesses here in the United States, uh, some of our presenters, I think, have ideas. I don't think you're limiting your uh, walk in her, a mile in her shoes to large corporations. So you can sign up uh, right away with Ruthann <laughs> for that program. Uh, I'm afraid we are out of time, but I thank our uh, presenters for hitting their marks. I mean, this is an amazing amount of time. Uh, well, I want to tell you that this uh, part of this will be repeated at what, 11.15? Yes. 11 and 15 in rooms F and G. F and G. And you will uh, have an opportunity to hear from Stan and Jamie again. But we will have uh, four new presenters on the panel. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for a very inspiring and rich uh, morning.